Yeah. Yeah, first of all, I love this stuff because I studied economics. I don't practice it, so it's kind of like a guilty pleasure for me. I know. Uh, a really good book that actually is uh, talks about some of this stuff and uh, delves into a few other things too is actually very proper for this. It's called The Skeptical Economist. It's not about skepticism, uh, but it kind of challenges. It, it has the example you gave with the ticket in there. Mm -hmm. And it just talks about how, you know, uh, some things are framed and how we make choices to where, you know, if you take the assumption that people are, you know, quote unquote, rationally have perfect information, they would never do it. Mm -hmm. But the reality is we don't. So it, it, it kind of shows how that can happen. Yeah. Um, a lot of this, these guys I mentioned before, Kahneman and Sversky, they shook up the world of economics because economists have these models of perfect rationality, which... Can I just say that's bullshit? Yeah, it, it, exactly. Uh, we deviate so wildly from it. Um, and a, a good social science is really more of a synthesis of psychology. Um, economics had to adapt to reality. I mean, it makes sense that, that our brains work like this. We were, they developed for the longest time in a situation where good enough was good enough. We weren't trying to think rationally, we were trying to survive, to get food, make babies, and pass on our genes. Now that we have larger brains, and not only that, have this structure within which we live that provides us a fairly safe environment, we have new demands on our brains that they need to meet. It's need, fairly new. We need to find some way of right. updating the hardware. Right, exactly. It's, um, it's like running a more modern software on an old computer. Um, there are times when there's going to be failures. It's pretty interesting how developing a system of adequacy has trained our brains to <coughs> Yeah, it's something... Um, I mean, this is, it's kind of depressing <laughs> to hear about it. Uh, we'll use reason more like uh, lawyers do, where we just try to craft an argument about, around what we already want to believe instead of just being swayed perfectly by only the evidence. Um, I don't know. Um, before you mentioned the terrorist thing, I was thinking about the biases that people have against airplane travel. They think that car travel is safer. I mean, that's definitely not true. Yeah. And then the availability uh, heuristic comes in when they see the, the fiery plane crash that occurs, you know, in another country under separate circumstances. Um, and and I was wondering about the the personal factors that you have about feeling out of control. You know, you feel like you're in control of a car, but you don't feel like you're in control of an airplane. So it's not that you're even looking at that. You can tell somebody the probability, and it doesn't matter because they have those personal preferences that can't override the logical yeah. things. Yeah, um, exactly. It's, it's like personal fear that they can't deal with. Yeah. Yep. Um, are, there, are there any studies on what people do when they are confronted with these biases and asked to like answer their questions again? Because there have been a lot of studies in the news recently about how when people who don't have th their facts right are confronted with the facts, they just retreat deeper into the lies that they've been told. So uh, one I didn't get to, um, uh, there's another one called the gambler's fallacy, where uh, our minds don't really understand randomness. So if you look at a roulette wheel, uh, it's pretty likely that you can get a string of like five or six reds in a row. But uh, remember, each spin is an independent event. Uh, but you can tell people this, and they will still think it's more likely uh, if you've had a string of reds for the next spin to, be, to turn up black. <laughs> so, I mean, you can, you can sit down with someone and explain this and then have them bet, and they'll still bet more on the other one after a string of the compliment. However, the probability of getting a string of reds as opposed to a mixture on each individual roll is the same for each, but over the course, it's less likely. Um, because it's so, that, but that's if you're right. predicting. So, so right, right. But if you're predicting, not like so, add that's right. so yeah, the what you want to act on the information is it's still well, it's less than fifty. It's because of the greens, uh, but it's just under fifty still for each spin. <clears throat> yeah. There was actually there was a talk uh, recently that uh, CFI uh, did uh, with Julian Galick that actually she did an experiment right there where she tossed a coin. 
uh, something like 50 or 100 times, I think it was 100 times in the air, just to see how it came up. And in the course of it coming up, she had a string of something like 15 tails in a row, and another string of like eight heads in a row. And flipping a coin is an issue because that, that gets into the fact that there's a slight difference in the weighting of the sides. And in addition to that, there's the way you throw it. Uh, there's probably... Yes, but the, the premise still yes. the premise still holds. You're not you're, you're betting money on the individual role. Right. You're and not betting money on how many reds will there be. And, so and that's that's why you know and it doesn't the point, matter. The point is that over the course of a long enough run, it will average out based on those characteristics. Even with the coin, it'll average out based on the characteristics of how it's thrown or of what the weighting is of the coin. So it might not be perfectly fifty, but it'll, a long enough run, yeah. it'll, it'll at least it'll at least be close to fifty or however much the weighting of the coin is. But even within that, you can expect long runs of, of numbers that seem completely opposed to that premise of randomness. Um, and the other thing I, I also wanted to say on this was uh, you were talking a lot about the, the other biases. And there's a, there's a researcher that, uh, that I'm familiar with from the computing side, uh, Bruce Schneier. And he does a lot of uh, cyber security stuff, but he does a lot of analysis on security itself. And he's written uh, for years, quite a few papers on exactly the ways in which our mind fails us on those uh, on those types of things: the the likelihood of an airplane crash, the likelihood of a terrorist event, um, and including the the loss aversion effect, uh, where you know if if you were offered a, a a ticket and said, "Would you like to gamble this and see if you could double or nothing your money?" versus offered a police ticket where you're going to lose money, but you can gamble and say, no, I'm not going to lose anything or I'm going to lose double. And people are much more likely to take that gamble when it's a loss because they want to, they want to hold on to that chance that they won't lose, lose anything. But when they have the positive money, that first amount of money is worth more to them, so they're more likely to hold on to it and not gamble for double or nothing, even though statistically it's exactly the same. Yeah. Yes. Um, I just wanted to say that this obviously also ties in with advertising as well. Um, can't say I advertise. My mother has told me she got a great deal because it was four ninety nine, not five dollars. You know, she just sees the four. Oh, the, the framing. <laughs> There's another great example of uh, dummy pricing, where you will have stores put out, say, uh, lower end product and higher end product, one of which is absurdly high, but. <laughs> Something that people wouldn't buy, but when you see the products next to each other, you think you're getting a great deal because, oh, well, at least I'm not paying for the high end. I still want this, and it's cheaper. Hey, look, it's a bargain. Yeah. It's a common effect used in restaurants. You always have something in a kind of wine list, something absurdly high, so you won't buy it until you buy the next one, which is just as absurdly high. Yeah. Yeah, it's everywhere. Uh, we are bias is exploited constantly. Yeah. Uh, when you were researching these biases, did you come across any techniques to counteract them? Uh, uh, um, no. <laughs> um, I mean, if you keep up on them, I just think of this as adding something to your toolkit that <clears throat> will help you assess things. Um, maybe you'll see the pattern somewhere else because this stuff is everywhere. Um, and you can be a little more skeptical towards the things that you read or hear. Yeah? Just telling someone about a bias doesn't change their bias so much. There are ways of showing the bias, like kind of clear. Well, so like with these examples, it's great because you can just point something out that's innocuous. It's especially important to point something out where someone doesn't have something invested. Uh, because if, if they're operating on one of these biases, you don't just want to say, like, look, you're biased. <laughs> uh, here's how. Um, so it's, you want to do it more in a neutral environment. That's how flame wars start over the Monty Hall problem. Yeah, the Mon <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, look up the Monty Hall problem. We do not understand probability at all. Uh, this is a PhD statisticians still don't understand the Monty Hall problem. Are there um, any kind of studies about whether men, men and women, are sort of more prone to different biases based upon gender? I mean, are women more likely to make you know this kind of 
have this kind of cognitive bias in men or more likely to have this kind of, you know, some other kind of cognitive bias? That's a really good question. I don't know. That I, you can tell a story for why, for things that you might have seen, uh, different genders behaving in different ways, but that might be an availability bias. <laughs> I would suspect that's not true. I think we're more alike than different. Like our brains are more alike than different. Let's consult the evidence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so to follow up on her question, um, to one way to like show a bias that I've seen that's been pretty effective is if you get a group of like 12 or 15 people at, at minimum, um, odds are significantly high that two of them have the same birthday. And you think 15 people are not going to have the same birthday, but the odds actually work out in, in favor. So that's actually a kind of a cool thing you can do. Yeah, I think the tipping point's around 22 people. Oh, really? Uh, I thought it was I, recall, cool. I think it's 22, 23. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, I'll, I'll say two things. I've done a lot of work with willingness to pay, which is sort of like your bird example, and also the framing issue. The framing issue can be really important if you're talking to a doctor about whether to choose a medical procedure. You have to listen really carefully to how he's thinking of the problem. And often you'll get two different uh, opinions, but it's based on their internal framing. And, and you need to sort of work through that very carefully about what, what's effective and not, and you know, whether they're selling you a loss or a hope. Uh, the other thing was I found in the environmental world where you try and assign values to things, like 2,000 birds, 20,200, it's a lot of birds, and it's, it's almost the same quantity in a way. But the other thing I found through comparisons of lots of kinds of things, it seems as though people are willing to give up the amount of the monthly a cable bill to buy the environmental good, whatever it is. Um, that seems to almost always be about the amount. <laughs> yeah. um, and because much larger amounts, they can't seem to deal with. That's really over the top. That's expensive. That's that's not just you know that's that's really tough and beyond you know most, what most people want to pay. But cable is sort of now their throwaway amount. Oh, I could always come up with. 30, 50, 80, you know. Yeah, uh, the it's a luxury you'd be willing for to forego. So it's a good thing the cable's getting more expensive. Right. It's, <laughs> an, interesting, it's an interesting, it's an interesting, important, interesting thing. All right. Well, thank you guys.